All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google Switzerland. And um, part of my job is to talk to webmasters like you guys and make sure that uh, the information that we have goes in your direction and feedback from all of you comes back to our teams as well. Um, so we have a bunch of questions that were already submitted. Uh, if one of you wants to start, uh, feel free to go ahead and grab a question. Hey, John. Hi. Hi. Um, I had the, a, a question and a suggestion, actually. Uh, the question is the following. So at cardhub.com, um, uh, we got hit by the latest Panda update. And we are literally you know, clueless on where the theme content uh, may exist on our site, uh, especially because uh, the past year and a half we have cleaned up a lot and we have also, um, we are regarded in the credit card space as kind of the authority uh, in terms of credit card content. And, um, and so I was wondering of whether either now or offline you may be willing to, I know Barry had some similar um, concerns on his blog, or whether you may be willing to kind of point out some areas that may be considered thin content by the algorithm. OK. Um, I'd have to take a look at your site in detail to, to kind of say much more. Um, but uh, I, I can take a quick look afterwards. Or if you have a thread in the help forum, if you can send me that link, that would be useful too. OK. That would be great. And then the suggestion is, um, and again, I don't think it's linked to Panda, but uh, uh, leading up to Panda, there were a few websites that literally uh, scraped every single page of our website. And so our Google Webmaster Tools uh, got filled and continues to get filled by junk. Essentially, these, uh, these websites have thousands of pages, yeah. thousands of links pointing to our website that are 404s. And, uh, and on the you know on the Google Webmaster Tools, there's just not a good way to clean up that um, and kind of make it stop reporting so that we can see the good things and not every day get a bunch of spam. Well, where do you see that in Webmaster Tools? So on the good on the 404s. On the 404 pages, so it's basically linking to pages that don't exist on your website anymore. Uh, they never existed. Uh, the, the way they scrape the content, uh, their link references for some reason got messed up. So they literally have thousands of pages uh, linking to us, uh, to four or four pages that never existed. And um, and even you know to the, some websites we have uh, contacted the uh, the host providers and we have brought down the entire website. Uh, one of them actually was hosted by AppSpot. And you guys were quick to take it down, but uh, uh, the 404 uh, notifications just keep coming in. Okay, so there are two things probably worth looking at there. On the one hand, 404s don't cause any problems for your website. It's not that this would be negative for your website in general. Um, you might have seen that before, so that's at least good to know. The other thing is, in Webmaster Tools, the 404s that we show are prioritized by, by their impact. So if the top 404s in Webmaster Tools are really random 404s that you don't care about, that means we don't have anything important that we can show you there. We found these 404s while crawling, which is kind of a technical thing that we do, but it's not that we found anything more important that you need to fix with those 404s. So that's but, kind of a, a good sign there, too. No, absolutely. My suggestion was that it is a little bit frustrating when using the user interface to essentially have a lot of junk uh, coming in. And if there was a way in the interface to communicate and say, hey, don't show me 404s from this domain. You know, I don't care where they are linking. I have disavowed them, etc. Or some other way when it's marked, like maybe another uh, way to market that fix. Um, that could be helpful, uh, and that was where the suggestion was coming from. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah. While we're, while we're talking about panda, can I squeeze in one other panda question? Sure. So. 
hub pages. We we recently brought in a ton of content from Squidoo, where it, in early September we started bringing over content from Squidoo, and was finished by kind of mid a few days before Panda 4.1 rolled out, and we're we're really trying to figure out where you know we've been working hard to to improve the site is. Could all that content that we brought over in that short period of time impacted our uh, impacted Panda for us? So just by having a lot of new content, that wouldn't be a problem. So that by itself wouldn't be an issue. Um, so it's definitely not not a matter of like a technical issue where you're importing a lot of content, where you're reading a lot, redirecting a lot of content to your site. That's something that our system should be able to handle. That shouldn't be a problem from our point of view. Um, with regards to the quality of the content, I guess that's harder for me to say because it's it really depends on the, the old and the new content and how that works well within your website. Uh, if you've been making significant changes right around when this was happening, it might just be that this is kind of like a fluctuation that's happening in between. And uh, when things settle down, I'm, I'm assuming things are kind of in a stable state now. That's something that, that should be reflected in the search results as well. So you'll probably see some changes as that settles down and as the new new data is updated again. So so continue just to clean up what we were working on and then wait for a next refresh? Yeah, I mean this is the the whole quality issue is something I I'd, I'd always continue working on and trying to find ways to recognize really high quality content and to recognize lower quality content that you could, for instance, no index. Uh, if you want to keep it on your site, that's fine. If people still kind of navigate within your website to find that content, that's fine too. But if you can recognize that it's lower quality, maybe putting it in a no index kind of helps us to focus on the higher quality content within your website. OK. OK, and nothing changed in general from 4.1 to how subdomains are treated as separate sites? Um, nothing that, that I'm aware of there, no. So that's something where if we can recognize that these subdomains belong to the main site, we'll treat them more like a main site. If we can recognize that they're essentially independent websites, we'll treat them like independent websites. And a lot of cases where you have like user-generated content with subdomains for the individual users or kind of different, um, let's say, I don't know, like uh, topical areas. That's something where we'd say that's probably more like a separate site than just one site. I guess topical areas is kind of borderline there. But especially when you're looking at something with different users, that would be a good reason for us to treat those as separate sites. Uh, for instance, on Blogspot, everyone has a different subdomain. And we don't say this is all one big website. Blogspot, this is essentially a lot of different websites. Uh, John, can I? Sure. Thank you. Uh, John, um, we had uh, been uh, pharma hacked. Uh, we cleaned the site, I think. Uh, never know. <laughs> but uh, now we are, uh, we are um, from, um, we're looking uh, with another step. I mean, uh, um, results uh, have cached uh, a clean, but the snippet is still compromised. Are they, um, ca can we still consider the site clean, or there is something else? I would use the, the Fetch and Google tool to try to test to see what, what your pages look like now. So to some extent, you'll see that directly when you visit those pages. But sometimes uh, these these hacked pages cloak to only see the kind of hacked content when you to the doctor. I fetched I fetched the uh, Google and the pages are clean, but I, I, I repeat I, I, the, my problem now is snippet. The snippet on page results can be different. I mean, even if the page cached is clean and fetched as Google as Google is clean, can snippets can be still old com and compromised? Sometimes uh, it happens that the snippet is kind of a little bit delayed from the rest of the site. Okay. So that might be happening there. Um, but it shouldn't be something that lasts, like, let's say, longer than a week. Okay. Um, if it's older than a week and you're still seeing the hack content in the snippet, 
then that might be something to, to send to us to take a look at. OK. If it's just that uh, these pages still rank for the hack content, then that's kind of normal, where we've seen this hack content on your pages. And if you do a site query and add maybe Viagra to the site query, then maybe we'll still show those pages because it used to be relevant there. But uh, that's not something you'd need to worry about. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure. Early in the uh, uh, this uh, broadcast, whatever you call it, um, you said basically that the 404 pages are ordered in importance. Did you say that? Yes. They are. Is that the first time you're saying something like that? I don't know. <laughs> We're I arguing about in the chat. Think, I think we announced that when we announced the feature in Webmaster Tools, like, how many years ago? So it has, like, uh, I think you were... Sorry? OK, you're muted now. <laughs> um, so we show them in Webmaster Tools, the 404 pages, and we sort them by priority, by default. So that's something where you'd see that there. And I, I'm just equating priority with importance, where if the top 404 pages that you see in Webmaster Tools are really random pages that never existed on your site that you don't really care about, then that's, that's a sign that we haven't found anything more important. And the priority, I think we mentioned some of the factors there in the blog post when we announced it. That includes things like, is this URL in your sitemap file? Is this something where you're, where you're seeing search traffic to that URL or where you were seeing search traffic? Those are the kind of things we'd look at for the priority. So essentially, if you're telling us that this is actually an important page and it returns a 404, then that's a sign that we should put it higher up on the list. Thank you. All right, let's grab some of the questions from the Q&A. Uh, any news about the Penguin update, potential release date, uh, new factors, et cetera? Um, at the moment, I don't have anything to announce with regards to Penguin. I know the engineers are working on something that should be available fairly soon, but I don't have any specific time frame for when that might happen. So not today, not tomorrow, but I, I'm guessing fairly soon, uh, certainly by the end of the year, is my current guess. And a lot of the, uh, the kind of the time frames with regards to new algorithms or features or bug fixes, those kind of things, is always a bit tricky when, you, when you're looking at something the size of Google's web search. Because on the one hand, we have to make all of these changes and run these algorithms and go through the test data to make sure that we're getting things right. On the other hand, we also have to um, kind of review the data that's generated there and make sure that it's actually useful data that's really providing useful additional information in search and not just something that we're essentially running but doesn't really have any new value in there. So that's something where when we're some, somewhere along in this process, we're maybe working on the algorithm, maybe refining the data that's used to create the algorithm or that's used, that's created by the algorithm there, then that's something where it's really hard to estimate when it will actually be ready and when it will be live. So if everything goes well, usually that's, that's a process that's a, quite a bit faster. If something in between goes wrong where we say, oh, we have to rethink what we're actually doing here, then maybe it'll take a week longer, maybe it'll take a month longer. It's, it's really hard to say that. The problem is you're hearing a lot of uh, disingenuous uh, webmasters and people are saying, yeah, it's already here, it's there. So can, in this Hangout today, can you, can we just, is there a way you can just be a bit more transparent? I mean, people are just saying Penguin is already out without, you know. Um, I mean, this is something where we do run tests from, from time to time to see how, how things kind of react where we do live tests. We do that a lot with uh, features in web search, for example. That's, that's one place where that's particularly visible, where we'll do maybe a test of 1% of the traffic, or maybe a test of, I don't know, 3 or 4 or 5% of the traffic with our updated data, with our updated algorithm, and see if that really brings out metrics that show that this is actually a good change or not. 
So those are the type of things I, I would expect people to see from time to time. Whether it's specifically from this Penguin algorithm or not is kind of uh, uncertain, because uh, if you're not looking at specific UI elements in search, you don't really see what specifically has changed there. OK. All right, John. So just to be clear, Gary said last week that um, if you disavowed anything from the past two weeks or so forward, those disavows will not be included um, in the next coming Penguin algorithm. Is that he said that clearly? I don't know if you heard it or not, but I wasn't there. Yeah, <laughs> um, I I don't know. It's it's something where I imagine you're you're currently right about at the edge where people the, the engineers will say, well, we have to take the data from somewhere, take a cut, and work with that. So it's quite possible that we've kind of reached that point or kind of gone past that point. But uh, I wouldn't say that it's useless to disavow things now, because there are always changes happening in search. And if you know of bad links pointing at your site, uh, that maybe a previous SEO built, that maybe you built accidentally, that you weren't really aware of them being bad at the time, then that's something you can always disavow now, even if maybe the, the current Penguin algorithm has already run. So I, I wouldn't worry about like that cutoff time and say, I'm not going to touch anything now. Right, because he did say it's going to run faster. So obviously, the next time they run it, those will be counted. Um, two is, do you know who at Google is going to go ahead and confirm this on the Google Plus page so we can keep refreshing constantly? I don't know. Maybe John. I'll definitely reshare whatever we, we announce, yeah. I mean. These are the kind of things we, we know you guys are waiting for this. We know a lot of people have put in a lot of effort to actually clean up these issues. There are probably still a lot of sites that never bothered cleaning up that, that have continued doing like their spammy things. And that's something where they probably won't see those changes. But at least uh, I know there are a lot of really uh, well-intentioned webmasters out there who noticed this was a problem, saw, saw the issue coming up, and worked to clean that up. So we're happy to kind of get the word out when it does come out. But even after cleaning Penguin, that doesn't mean that the site will still you know, come back to life. I mean, there's so much other stuff that the webmaster should have looked oh, at, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can never really say that uh, my site was ranking number two one year ago, and this algorithm brought my site down to number 10. Therefore, if this algorithm were reverted, my site would be back at number two. There are so many things that happen in, in web search over the course of a year that you can't really expect things to be exactly the same if you've cleaned up this problem. And the other thing to keep in mind is maybe your site was unnaturally ranking higher at that point. So if there were, for example, a lot of unnatural bad links, and we had uh, incorrectly counted those for your site at that time, it might have ranked higher than now, where if you've removed all of those bad links, and we essentially have the current state. So that's, that's something also worth keeping in mind. But I, I know there are a lot of people out there that have spent a lot of time to clean things up and really improve their websites across the board. So I'm happy, hoping that uh, those kind of sites will be seeing a nice jump as well. But as always, we have a lot of different algorithms. And uh, to some extent, if you've been working to clean up your site, you should have been seeing some of those positive changes as well in the meantime. But I, I know this is a tough topic, so I'm, I'm happy to keep you guys informed about this. But uh, I'm also happy to look at some of the other questions that we have in our Hangout. So let's take a look what, what else we have here. Um, John, can I just quickly uh, chime in and ask you one thing about that? Um, sure. There was, I, I put a link at the very top of the chat. Um, and I also sent it to you in an email um, just recently. And it's a it's a uh, a spreadsheet with thousand well thousands with a couple of hundred links probably in it or something like that, and uh, it shows lots of PR six sites uh, selling very very spammy sites selling links. They have been I reported it over a year ago. I've sent it to you a few times, random examples, but this is a full list. I spent a long time doing, and I'm concerned as to why there are so many PR six sites that are really really spammy getting away with it and um, you know forget about the people who are buying from them I'm I'm wondering why this isn't being dealt with 
has it been dealt with and we're just still seeing the PR on there but I'm still seeing those sites ranking very well um, and they look like examples that you always say might have slipped through the cracks and I can't understand for the life of me why it's taken a year with multiple requests to have them removed and nothing's uh, well not removed but to be dealt with it seems yeah. like a, a, a serious concern I mean they are really spam are they like no junkie sites? Junkie sites? Yeah, I mean they're they're junk sites that have been selling PR sixes, loads of them. Um, and there's there are a few things where we do take action that you might not see directly. On the one hand, yeah. PageRank is something that we haven't updated for I think over a year now, and we're probably not going to be updating it going forward at least uh, in the toolbar page rank. So that's something where it's really hard to take that information and sure. kind of work on that. And we have a lot of ways to kind of recognize these kind of problematic links and to treat the sites that are essentially selling those kind of links in a way that essentially blocks the page rank from passing from those sites anyway. But uh, I, I didn't get your email recently. You mentioned it, I think, on Google+, but I didn't get anything yeah. But I'll, I'll definitely take this list and uh, go through it with the web spam team to see if there's anything there that uh, our algorithms or the web spam team at the moment has missed out on. So yeah. That's... Okay. Yeah, I'd appreciate that because uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, if I if I've got it completely wrong, I'd rather know that and then and not bother you or or waste my time looking to do you know to help in that kind of way. Yeah. Um, no. It's something where we've also internally discussed how we can help make it easier for people who are reporting web spam issues so that they kind of, on the one hand, understand what kind of issues we're actually taking action on. And on the other hand, we can also recognize these people and say, well, this guy is really good at reporting web spam. We should take his reports a little bit seriously. And that's something where, at the moment, we don't really have the, the kind of infrastructure to do that automatically. But uh, I know the web spam team is looking into that to see what we can do to kind of take these web spam reports a little bit easier and a little bit uh, such that we can take action on them a little bit faster and a little bit, I don't know, more visibly, maybe, so that at least the person who's reporting them knows this was useful or this was essentially irrelevant for us. Sure. I mean, what we can say for sure is that they're selling, they're selling uh, do follow links. I mean, that's that's for certain. Um, whether or not they've got any power, sure. You know, that's something we haven't got a clue. But uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks, John. Sure. All right. Um, Yoast recommends that all affiliate links be masked. He recommends that we have a separate folder for affiliate links blocked by robots text. Uh, is this okay to do so if affiliate links are already no follow? Should we redirect them either way? Um, essentially, from our point of view, we want affiliate links not to pass PageRank. So if you're blocking them with a no follow, that's fine. If you want to block them with a robots text file, that's fine too. That's not something that we'd say you need to do. But if you can't, uh, for example, use no follow because of your CMS, then maybe going through a robot it, uh, kind of redirecting script is, is a good idea. But essentially, the main point from our side is they shouldn't be passing page rank. And you can do that by robots text, or you can do that by no follow. So, so on that point, John, uh, Amazon.com, their affiliate program, uh, are all links pointing directly to their website uh, with a URL parameter. Does that mean that for a site that, that big, uh, they're not getting a, any credit for any links pointing to them with an affiliate tag? Um, we do try to recognize the, the main affiliate systems ourselves, and we take action on those links directly as well. So that's something where uh, if we can recognize that everyone is doing it wrong, everyone is linking maybe without the nofollow for these specific programs, we'll kind of do that uh, transparently on our side. So they wouldn't like, be penalized for those links. Um, it's also not the case that we ignore all links to Amazon because of that, but we try to recognize the ones that are actually kind of affiliate links. And like you said, with an affiliate parameter, that's something that we can recognize and kind of follow up on there. And this isn't something where we'd say we're like searching for these sites and trying to penalize them. We're not trying to penalize affiliates in any way. It's you can have a fantastic affiliate-based website, and that's that's perfectly fine. We just want to make sure that if you're an affiliate-based website that you actually have some unique and compelling content of your own, 
and that the value of your website is with the content on your website, not with this affiliate link, essentially. Got it. Um, if Webmaster Tool show that we have 404 pages, what should we do? Should all 404s be redirected to the home page, or might this be a bad thing to do? Um, essentially, if you have 404 pages, I take a look at the, the list in Webmaster Tools and definitely look at the top ones there. And if you can tell that these are all really random 404s, then that's a sign that we haven't found anything really important as a 404 on your site. On the other hand, if you can see that within this top list, we have URLs that you actually want to have indexed that maybe accidentally returned a 404, or that you accidentally removed and you didn't realize uh, that you had deleted these pages instead of renaming them or moved them around, then that's something I'd recommend fixing. And having a 404 on pages that you have removed that you don't want to have indexed is completely fine, or having a 404 on a URL that never existed before, then that's perfectly fine, too. That's not something that you have to kind of mask or hide with redirects. Um, 404 is, is a perfectly normal technical thing, tool to, to use on a website. Uh, can I have two separate websites with two separate locations use almost identical content? It's not, oh, it's, it's legitimate content, not spam. Uh, one business uh, located in one state, another one in another state. How can I be sure Google won't penalize these sites? Uh, from our point of view, duplicate content is primarily a technical problem in the sense that uh, when someone is searching for that content that you're sharing across those two websites, we have to pick one of those URLs and show it in search. We won't show both of them if we think they're essentially duplicate. Um, so we pick one of those, show it in search, and that'd be the one that'd be visible there for that specific query, for that specific uh, set of content. So it's not the case that either one of these would be penalized, but we just wouldn't be showing both of them at the same time in search. And sometimes there are completely legitimate reasons to have multiple websites like this. Um, that's not something where I'd really worry about there. What I would kind of try to keep in mind there is that you'd want to limit this to a reasonable number of websites. Um, a handful of pages, a handful of different locations is fine. If you have uh, a business that's active in every, every city in the country, then I wouldn't create different websites for every city. We kind of see that more as being spammy. So if you're essentially just randomly creating these pages and just trying to stuff them into the search results, that would be kind of spammy. If these are really two legitimate businesses that you're running that happen to share some of the content because they're essentially run by the same business, then that's fine. Um, I've been developing my current domain for approximately five years. It has a .NET extension. I was recently able to purchase a .com and .org versions of the same domain. The .com is 13-year domain age. Uh, what should I do? Um, redirect my links. Um, so essentially, I just pick one of those domains that you want to keep using and uh, redirect your content there. So if you want to move to your .com because you think that's a better choice of a domain, that's fine. That's something you can do. If you want to stick to your .NET and just redirect the other two domains to your .NET version, that's fine, too. Um, one thing to keep in mind is everything. every time you move from one domain to another, you'll have a certain period of fluctuations as things kind of uh, fluctuate, move around, and it takes a certain amount of time for the, that to settle down. So if you want to move to a different domain, maybe do that at a time when your business seasonally is not as active as it uh, otherwise might be during the year. And uh, another thing to keep in mind is that when you do move it to a different domain, um, there are some things that kind of get lost or kind of uh, diminished there in the sense that uh, we'll try to pass along as many of the signals as we can, but some of those are kind of tied to your old domain, and we don't pass those along. So you, it's kind of normal to see a tiny drop when you're moving from one domain to another, um, but it's probably not something that you'd really be able to track there. So I wouldn't just randomly move around your domains just because you happen to have them. I'd really think about where you want to be in the long run and make sure that you're focused there for the long run. 
With regards to the age of these domains, that's not something I'd worry about there. That's not something that uh, our algorithms would be taking into account specifically there. So I wouldn't say just because one domain is older than the other one, you should use that one. But you might think about this from a branding point of view, where you say .com is more recognized than .net, so maybe I'll move to .com. But uh, that's not something I'd say you'd, you'd need to do from an SEO point of view. But according to your patents, uh, there is something where a domain is old, so you take that to consideration, no? Um, I mean, one thing that kind of happens is if you have a website running for a really long time, then you'll have collected a lot of signals over those years. So that's something that we kind of keep there. On the other hand, if you're moving to a different domain, then we try to recognize that type of move, and we treat it as a site move. We don't say, well, everything that's been collected from this old domain is therefore valid for this new domain that's actually kind of moving there. So that's the kind of situation where naturally you would collect things over time, but that doesn't mean that you can just combine them with random other domains and say, oh, well, now my, my site is a combined age of 25 years, and all those signals apply to my site just because they've been there. So I wouldn't necessarily just move to an older domain just because it's older. Okay. Hey, John. Hi. Um, I wanted to show you an example, and you can tell me if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, can you go to this URL? OK. I hope it's not a bad thing. <laughs> so if you look at the cache page that Google has, so this is one of the scrapers I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So they have scraped uh, our content. And if you, if you click on the cast page, uh, Google says this is the page, uh, this is Google's cast of cardhub.com, da, 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 da. Well, I didn't ask for the cast page of cardhub.com. I asked for the cast page of that spammy site. Yeah, so essentially what's, what's happening there is we're recognizing that this site is scraping your site. And we're saying, well, this is a scraped copy of this other site that we know about. And the other, other page is essentially the one that we choose to index. So we'll say, we've indexed this URL. We have some content here. But actually, the content is the same as this main site. So we'll show that on the cache page as well. So that's actually a kind of a sign that we're kind of following the scraper along. But we're essentially focusing on your content and not on their content. So with from a, a query, from a I'm standpoint, that. wouldn't it be much better to um, either not index that site at all. But, I mean, what's the benefit of indexing a site that you are already know is a clear scraper and a spam? And, and the second thing is, isn't it from a user standpoint, again, a little bit confusing. I, I'm looking at the cache page. Again, I don't think any users do that, because I don't think you go show them in any search results. But maybe there are some edge cases where I'm looking for the cache page of this, and I'm looking at a comp at a different URL. Yeah, it's it's always a bit of a tricky situation in, in a case like this, where you're specifically doing a site query of one site. And we recognize that the content is duplicate, that this is something that we've indexed under, under multiple URLs. But you're specifically asking for like a URL from this site. So, that's something where we say, well, we know this content is actually the main content is on Cardhub or wherever. And uh, we've also got a, a URL here from this site where this user is specifically asking about. Uh, okay. that is essentially the same. So kind of what we're doing is trying to show you what you're asking for. So if you specifically ask for this content, we'll show it to you. But that doesn't mean we'd be showing it in search. That doesn't mean that we'd be kind of like splitting any value among those sites. This is essentially just trying to do what the user asks us. And okay. in this case, it's confusing. And is it fair to say that this is a classic example that you should disavow? Or is it something like that you wouldn't bother with because obviously we didn't set up the spammy yeah. site? I, I wouldn't worry about this one, actually. This is something where if this is a clear scraper site, then we'll, we'll pick up on it. And we picked up on this URL specifically. Uh, we noticed that it's actually your content. I, I don't think there's anything that you need to do there. With regards to disavow, I don't think you'd need to do this anyway there, because these aren't like unnatural bad links. These are, this is essentially just a, a copy of your content. So 
so, so it, just to make it clear, so you're saying we shouldn't disavow things that we had nothing to do with? Um, I think if you found something that you don't want to be associated with, putting it in a disavow file is absolutely fine. It won't cause any problems. And maybe but it's not like all the things, oh, we had something to do with this scraper, right? No, no. It, okay. The disavow doesn't mean that you have anything to do with it. It's not an admission of guilt or anything. It's just you don't want to be associated with the, these links. Fine. That's that's something you can choose. OK. Cool. OK. Hey, Thank John. You. How are you doing? Hi, Josh. How was it in Switzerland today? Nice. It looks nice in the reflection behind you. <laughs> I, I have a quick question for you there. Um, user experience seems to be important for Panda, but I'm, I'm slightly concerned. Um, is it possible that competitors, now this is a little far-fetched, but is it possible that competitors could hire, I don't know, people on some forum to go around your website and pretend like it has a bad user experience and bounce around and, and stuff like that, or I don't know what they would do, but bounce around, go back to Google. Is it possible for them to do that? And if it is, how would we combat that? I guess, theoretically, the best way to combat that would just have a really good site and have thousands of people who love it. So if 20 people go on there and seem to hate it, it doesn't matter? I guess that makes sense, yeah. I mean. I, I don't see this as a theoretical issue. I, I know there, there are people that try to do this all the time. And that's something that I, I wouldn't worry about from Google's point of view. Um, these kind of um, activities, you've seen them on Mechanical Turk. You see them on Fiverr, for example. That's something that's, I don't know, been happening since a really long time. So I wouldn't call it too far-fetched. But at the same time, I wouldn't say that that's something you'd need to worry about with regards to Google or probably the other search engines. Well, the security stuff you can use as well, uh, Josh, for those kind of stuff. Um. Yeah, I think there, there's some kind of like uh, plugins that you can use to kind of catch those kind of uh, activities. But essentially, if someone is offering this as a service where they're saying, well, I'll pay you, I don't know, 10 cents for every site that you visit on the internet, then that's something that they'd be doing with their normal browser, then that's something that's really hard to catch from your site directly. But no, no, I, I'm, saying, I'm saying in terms of infrastructure uh, uh, protection, uh, there, there are services out there that uh, can go directly to your server and figure out, OK, this is a bad bot or a bad user that keeps on coming, and it can recognize. And then, you know, so there are sure, sure. Uh, solutions for this, uh, Josh. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's a, that's a possibility as well. but. Uh, from Google's point of view, this is definitely not something I'd, I'd worry about. OK, thanks, John. All right, let's grab some more from the Q&A. Um, why would an incorrect page rank for a search term and not the most optimized one? Links pointing to it, keyword stuffing. Google isn't ranking the right pages for some search terms. And ranking affiliate, affiliated pages instead. Um, I probably have to take a look at some of the examples to see what specifically you're looking at there. Uh, within a website, sometimes it happens that we can't recognize uh, what a specific page is about. Or maybe it looks like a, a page is kind of like artificially inflating its importance uh, with regards to specific terms. So that could be from keyword stuffing on those pages. Uh, a lot of times, we also just see technical issues within a website, where maybe the internal linking structure isn't as clear as it could be, uh, those kind of things. But uh, if you have specific examples, I'm happy to take a look at that to see what we should be doing better there, and what we might want to tweak in our algorithms to recognize that a little bit better. Uh, John, related to that question, um, how do you, with all the keywords basically pretty much disappear from any statistics, how do you determine which pages people are going to wrongly through keywords? Um, for example, on mine, um, if you type Virtual Office London, you go to the home page instead of our London page. So first of all, how do I recognize those pages? Now I can't use keyword terms. And second of all, um, how do I then deal with that situation? I mean, that's something where you see a lot of information in Webmaster Tools, at least the, the keywords that people are searching for, which you can also try out directly to see 
what they might be seeing in search. So that's probably what, what you did there. You know that these are keywords people are searching for. So you went to Google Co. UK and said, I'm looking for whatever London. And yeah. you probably saw that the wrong page is showing up. So that's something that's kind of an iterative process there, which I think is, is kind of normal in this case. It's not something where there's really a direct one-to-one -one mapping that we provide. Uh, with some keywords, when we see a lot of activity in Webmaster Tools, we'll also show the landing pages that we found uh, there that they're ranking as well. We'll show that in Webmaster Tools. We don't show that for all keywords, all keyword combinations, though, because sometimes we just don't have enough data to actually provide useful information there for you. So that's something where, to some extent, you'll see that there. To some extent, you have to try that out. Uh, with regards to what to do when you see that it's showing the wrong page, that's always a bit harder. So essentially, what you want to do there is kind of the same as you would with any kind of SEO activity, is make sure that your technical foundation is, is kind of as good as it should be. So the internal links are working properly. The content is essentially set up correctly within the website. And then work to make sure that the quality side is, is correct as well. So that your London page, for example, isn't just keyword stuff London text or copies of Wikipedia text. I know this isn't the case with your site specifically, but uh, sometimes we see those things on the web. So those are usually the kind of situations there. If this is something that's completely wrong on our side, then that's Sometimes useful to bring back to the search engineers as well, where we say, for this specific keyword combination, we're showing the home page of the site, when clearly the home page is on a much, much more general area than actually what the user was searching for. And to send people to the home page would be to provide them a big disservice. So that's the kind of situation where we'd say, we should take a look at that on our algorithmic side and talk to the search engineers and make sure that we're getting that a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what, that's generally why I feel it's happening. Because um, yeah, it's just not a good situation for our customers to land on our homepage, and especially if we can't detect the keywords now to make sure that we can maybe display something to them to say we can see that you're looking for London. So the first item we're going to show you is London related, so we can point you in the right direction. We obviously can't do that anymore. Um, and uh, the London landing page, we know that's what they're looking for. So um, yeah, it's kind of a difficult situation for us. Um, yeah. It's a bad user experience because we cater for our, uh, 150 different locations around the world. So we know that the, the home page is too generic, and probably losing out on sales and disappointing customers. And now we're ranking well in Google. We're in like third place. Um, you know, now it's not entirely accurate. And if some search user group of yours actually goes through the search results and says, is this a quality site to be pointing the people to? Well, what if you have a look at everybody else's landing page for London? Theirs is good and ours isn't, and we could be demoted on that basis. Yeah, our London page is actually excellent. Well, that's not something where we demote a site for. That's something, so the specifically the, the kind of the um, search results, reviews that we do. Um, that's something that we do more to kind of fine tune our algorithms and make sure that the algorithms are working right. So if we were to recognize that we're showing your general London page instead of your general page instead of the London specific one, then that's something where in the worst case, if someone from the, the search quality team were re reviewing that search result, they'd say, we need to work on the search result. So it's not that your site is bad, it's essentially our algorithm that's that's bad in a case like that. So yeah. we don't kind of go through the search results on that basis and say, well, this site really matches those search results. We're going to make sure it always stays number one. Uh, we're essentially just testing our algorithms and making sure that we're getting those improvements right. And right. a lot of times what happens with our algorithms there is that we'll take two search results pages and say, this is with maybe one version of the algorithm, this is worth a, with a different version of the algorithm, or with an algorithm without this algorithm. And we'll have reviewers go through those pages and say, this is good, or this is bad, or uh, these results are better, and this is why, so that we can fine tune the algorithm. So it's not that we kind of tweak the sites out of the search results, but make sure that we're showing the right pages there. 
Uh, so these uh, Google reviewers, uh, quality search reviewers, where are they from? Are they like from around the world, or they're specifically from California? Like, we try to get them from around the world, and that's something where we try to do what what we need to do to kind of like make people be able to test these search results. So specifically, if we're looking at pages in French, then we probably don't want to take. The, the average American who doesn't really speak French to review those search results because they wouldn't be able to do that. We really need to have native speakers who actually can look at that specifically. Well, you so, always have uh, Google Translate. I mean, yeah, I don't know if we'd want to use Google Translate to review our, the quality of our search results. I, I really like Google Translate, but uh, sometimes it has some creative ideas. Right. All right, let's run through some more of these questions in the Q&A and uh, see if we have some time afterwards. Uh, can we expect any more and often updates in Webmaster Tools, for example, in search queries, click-through rates, uh, more examples from late domains? Uh, yes, we're working on improving the quality of the, the data and the features there specifically around search queries at the moment. So I'm hoping at some point uh, in the future, maybe, I don't know, it's hard to say, early next year, I guess, uh, we could see more more there. Um, does Google always treat nofollow links as nofollow, or does it act as a suggestion similar to what the canonical tag does? Uh, in general, the nofollow is something that we use as a technical method, so it's something that we try to follow as, as much as possible. So. It's not something that we'd use as a signal, but at the same time, we still kind of reserve the right to uh, act upon any abusive issues that we run across. So I'm not aware of any kind of abusive issues around the nofollow that we've seen in the past there, but uh, we, we kind of try to keep that door open so that if we recognize someone doing really, really sneaky things with this uh, or with any of the other methods that we have available, then we'll still kind of reserve the right to take action on that. and kind of try to keep our, our search results clean in that regard. So primarily, it's a technical tool that we treat one-to-one. -one. We essentially drop those links completely from our link graph. Um, I just want to keep that one disclaimer that there might be some, ch some places where we kind of have to take action on this, even if we do drop those links. Uh, can medical services and therapies have reviews for rich snippets? Sure, that's essentially open. That's not limited to any specific kind of product or service. Uh, I collect reviews for my services on one page on the website. The reviews have no ratings with the stars. It's essentially just text. Can I use this page for rich snippets and ratings? Um, essentially, for review rich snippets, we want to have one clear page that's about one specific product or service, and that's essentially what you can use for, for rich snippets there. So if you have one page on your website that's for everything that you offer, then that's probably not so useful for rich snippets. John, typically or generally, you wouldn't want to see rich snippets in general, general on the home page. Um, for most sites, we wouldn't expect to see that on the home page because the home page is about the, the business in general. There can be situations where maybe the home page is about a specific product or service, and then it might make sense to put that on there. But for most businesses, you have a general home page and the services and products are somewhere apart else from the home page. Uh, how to optimize an image for SEO is having a keyword in the file name and useful alt tag, all that's needed. Uh, I think both of those are good, good things to have. Another good aspect is to have some kind of a subtitle on those pages. And finally, one more aspect to kind of keep in mind is that uh, the clearer it is that this image is about a specific topic, the easier we can actually rank it for that. So if you have a page with hundreds of thumbnails on there and they have a subtitle and alt text, then that's really hard for us to pick up on. Uh, whereas if you have one specific landing page per image, then that's often a lot easier for us to recognize that this image is about the specific topic. Uh, 
if a website is hit by Panda, cleans up and fixes everything, what's the next step? Should we submit our URL for verification or just have to wait until the next Panda to regain our rankings? Uh, essentially, working to really clean up your website's content, the quality of your website overall is really important there. Uh, you don't need to do anything technical past that. So you don't need to do a reconsideration request, uh, which, as far as I know, you can't do for algorithmic issues anyway. Uh, you don't need to request uh, the URLs to be recrawled. But uh, you could do that, for example, if you wanted to kind of have that updated a little bit faster in search. Uh, for issues like Panda, which are essentially site-wide issues, usually the crawling of individual pages is not going to make a big difference. So really make sure that your website is uh, the highest quality it can be overall. And uh, essentially, we'll pick up on that data over time and take that into account. Uh, one thing to keep in mind specifically with our regards to our quality algorithms is we're not just looking to see if the text is unique and say, well, this is unique text, therefore it must be high quality. We really want to see the, the whole website overall as being high quality. So it's not just enough to say, well, this text, if I copy and paste it into Google, doesn't show any other matches, therefore it's great quality content. We really want to see that there's more behind it than just like unique text. Unique text is easy to create. The high quality website takes a bit of work and it takes a bit of analysis of what users are actually trying to do on your website and making sure that your website matches what their expectations. So that's something that's really hard to define and not really a technical issue where you can say, well, I fixed up the quality of my website, therefore uh, Google will take that into account immediately. It's not that black and white. So that's something where taking a step back, getting more people's opinions uh, can make a really big difference. Um, I have too many reviews for one page, but want to send the count on the home page. And notes say the page must also contain review markup for each reviewed item. Uh, count should only re include reviews on your own site. Uh, it implies review count of the site, not the page. Um, I'd have to take a look at the root snippet guidelines and in, in specifically with regards to that. So I don't really know the answer. To that. I know some sites kind of have this paginated review system where you have uh, one main review page and then you can paginate through the individual reviews. Uh, from my point of view, I think that's fine, but I'd have to take a look at the root snippet guidelines to really double check that. Uh, John, did you do a, a hangout about uh, hreflang and um, the uh, HTTPS? You said you were going to try and make it clearer for everybody. I don't remember. I'm, I may have missed a, a, a whole display. You said you were going to put a slide together for it. Um, I don't remember. Huh. It, How many hangouts? It, yeah. Um, it would have been in the last um, like two hangouts if you did. Um, yeah. I might have missed it, but you mentioned it about uh, three, three or four weeks ago. Um, I don't remember, so that's probably a no. <laughs> yeah. Did you possibly post something on your uh, Google Plus as a, maybe a drawing of some sort sure. from somewhere that explains exactly if you have HTTPS and you have hreflang and any Pinocchio kind of what are issues, how to exactly structure that? So sure. That um, yeah, that would be very helpful. Sure. Hey, hey Joe, you mentioned you mentioned about Panda. I know at some point you guys had uh, uh, announced that uh, you were um, doing updates on a you know on a frequent basis. It was part of the daily processing, if you will. It, it appears that now they have moved to more one-off updates like Penguin. Uh, is that a fair assessment? And if yes. Do you guys have any plans of moving Panda back into a rolling uh, schedule so that uh, you know webmasters don't have to wait for the next refresh to see improvement? Um, one thing we did there is essentially update the algorithm. So that's that's one aspect there, but it should be fairly regular now. So it shouldn't be something where I'd say you have to wait six months before an update there. I, I know with the previous Panda as well, we've been running updates a lot more frequently. So that's something where I imagine in this case as well, we'll just be kind of rolling these more frequently. 
And this was kind of a, a bigger step because there were some bigger changes there. Good. But it's still not part of the daily processing. And so, like, for example, you would still not expect to see some sites recovering until you have an official refresh. Um, I, I don't think we'd announce those kind of refreshes because they just happen so regularly. So it's not something, I don't think you'd count on it as being daily, something where we'd say this happens every six months, therefore it's a big jump. It's, it's more regular than that. But I don't have any specific time frame where I can say you should expect these changes to happen weekly or monthly. That's something where I know the engineers like to have a little bit of flexibility in that uh, when they can roll it out more frequently, when they can just have this data update automatically, they'll try to do that. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer to review bigger changes, and they like to have the flexibility of being able to do that. So that's, that's not something where I, I can promise any specific time frame, but I know the regular updates is definitely one of the things they're trying to do there. Good. OK, so even if you guys do not change the algorithm, you will still try to rerun it as often as you can. Yeah. OK, thank you. That helps. Uh, I'm an author of a book which has reviews on Amazon. Is there any way to use them as my author website and re re snippets? What about reviews I get via email, which I publish on my author site? So if these reviews were submitted somewhere else, then that's not something we'd want to see you reuse for rich snippets. So don't like scrape the, the reviews from Amazon and put them on your website. We really want the, the unique reviews on your website itself to be marked up for rich snippets. So it should be content that's unique to your website. Um, with regards to reviews that you get sent in by email, one of the difficulties there is, of course, like mapping that to any kind of a star rating. If someone sends you an email and says, hey, this was a great book. I really enjoyed it. How do you map that into a star rating without like skewing it in your favor? And how do you kind of pick and choose those emails and say, well, these five people that really love my book, I'll put them on my website and use them for rich snippets. And those five people that didn't like my book, I'll just assume that I never received those emails and kind of ignore them. So when you're filtering things like that, that's something where I kind of worry that uh, rich snippet markup isn't really the best choice there. So bringing them onto your website is a great idea. Marking them up for rich snippets, probably not so much. OK, um, we have a, no, one minute left. Well, let's see if we have any other. John, meetings. can I quickly ask you um, sure. about um, my code.uk site, hreflang site, um, in Webmaster Tools shows 20 pages indexed, but um, there's thousands of pages if you use the site query. Uh, is something wrong with Webmaster Tools? Hopefully not. Otherwise, I'll have to talk to them this evening when I have a meeting with them. Um, where are you looking? Are you lo looking at the sitemaps count? Or uh, yes, I go into the sitemap page, and um, it says there's it's got 8,000 pages that it's that it's obviously got from my sitemap, but it only shows 20 pages are actually indexed. But that's not true. But I wonder whether or not there was some complication because it was an href length. Uh, not the you know not the original and maybe some swaps happening or something, but the site query shows something very different. Uh, hreflang should be irrelevant there, so that shouldn't matter. But specifically with regards to sitemaps index count, one thing to keep in mind is the sitemaps count looks at the very exact URL that you have in your sitemap file. So if there's a slightly different URL that's actually indexed, we won't count that for your sitemap file. And sometimes we'll see that with like URL parameters, uh, sometimes with dub, 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 non dub, 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 with uh, upper, lowercase in the URL, uh, dashes or underscores, where maybe your CMS kind of interchangeably uses those. But you submit one version in the sitemap, and a slightly different version is indexed. And then we say, well, that URL that you submitted isn't actually indexed, therefore we're not going to count it. So what I tend to do in cases like that is try to break the sitemap file down. So break it up maybe into five or 10 sitemap files that are kind of easier to, to look at, and uh, submit those in Webmaster Tools. And if you find a sitemap file that has zero indexed URLs, 
then take a few of those sample URLs in the sitemap file and do something like an info query in, in Google, like just info, colon, and then the URL, and see which URL is actually indexed for that content. So we'll probably have crawled that URL and kind of indexed the content there, but maybe we picked a different one to kind of index the, the content under. And with an info query, you'll quickly see that. And it sounds like maybe there's a systematic issue with your sitemap files. Uh, maybe something simple like a trailing slash or no trailing slash. Those are the kind of things where sitemaps would say, well, this isn't the exact URL. You're, maybe you're indexing the wrong thing. Uh, but from your point of view, you'd say, well, this is good enough. And maybe that's a good sign to kind of update the sitemap file or to look at the internal links on your website and say, well, internally I'm linking to this version of the URL. I'll match it to point to the version that I have in my sitemap files. So it's probably not a critical issue, but it's uh, usually something worth cleaning up so that you can look at this data in a little bit more of an easier to understand way. Do you have a couple more seconds there, John? Sure. Um, Matt Cutts mentioned something interesting at the last SMX Advanced. He mentioned that uh, your web forms should have autocomplete, if possible. Uh, he was talking about mobile, I believe. But I was wondering, how important is it to have a streamlined, uh, you know, not like 10 questions on the web form, but as few fields to fill in as possible and autocomplete it? How important is that for your quality algorithms? Um, I don't think we use that at all for search. So, he was he was just mentioning that uh, desktop and mobile uh, people get lazy. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think we use that at all for search. Uh, what we are looking at is generally if a page has a mobile version or not, and that's something that we'd like to reflect in search, where we'd like to treat that appropriately in the search results. But if it's a mobile friendly version and it happens to have fifty fields for like a contact form then that's essentially your loss. That's not something where we'd say, well, this is a bad search result. It's essentially someone going to your website and not being able to kind of follow through and complete whatever task they were trying to do. And essentially, this is a client coming into your store, and you make it so hard for them to actually buy anything from you, <laughs> then it's, it's your loss. It's not something where we'd say, this is a problem from search. Uh, specifically, but uh, they, we send them to your site. They kind of like the content on your site, but they're not able to follow through. And that's more your problem than, than our problem. OK, great. All right. So let's take a break here. Um, I, I think the next Hangout we have uh, planned for on general best practices for 2014. Uh, to kind of see what things have changed over time. And the next Monday Hangout after that, we'll have someone join us from the Google News team. So if you're a Google News publisher, be sure to join us. Barry Schwartz? Yeah, sure. Go for it, yeah. OK, so with that, I'd like to thank you all for your questions and uh, for your time. It's been really insightful, uh, lots of good feedback as well. Um, I'll definitely take the spam report that I got there and pass it on to the team, make sure that we're looking at that properly, and uh, double check my notes to see if I'm missing, missing anything else. So hope you guys have a great week, and maybe see you guys again. Thank you, John. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, John. Have a good meeting this afternoon. Bye. Thanks, John. Bye, John.